So we have this guy, the most successful pastor up to now, 120,000 people repent in a single day. He's waiting, though, because his heart is wrong. He's literally upset about this, and he's waiting for God to squish him. So here is chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my own country? That that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it's better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did not make it grow which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? Wow. All right. Whoa, ladies and gentlemen, Jonah, you would think that a guy that's been through all of this, whose main occupation it is to be a prophet, somebody who is way more in tune than God with the average person, right? I'll do what you say, God. I will go, I will do, I will speak. You're God, I am not. Um, I'll do what you're saying. And he pushed back at every point. Even still, he was one of the most successful preachers that ever lived. You want to talk about a killer resume as a pastor, man. Yeah, 120,000 people came uh, into full repentance within a few days. Uh, That was me. Chink. Well, obviously it was God, but you get the point. That's quite a successful resume. Now, yesterday we, bar- we, we barely got to touch on this, and I want to really hit this again. <clears throat> Success does not equal happy, people. Stuff does not equal happy. The things of this world do not equal happy. The temporary things don't equal happy. You may have like a little shot, like like an electric jolt of, boy, that's cool. Like I got a car, or I got a thing, or I got a great job. And you feel like super excited. But then when things wear down, you realize it was always temporary and it's always fading and it's never going to fully satisfy you know, you know what I'm talking about, guys? The, the, that things that are great on the surface 
they, they never fully satisfy. You know what I'm saying? You see, we go to God with an attitude of, well, if God gives me what I want, then I'll be happy. <sighs> if God gives me what I want, then I'll be happy. But God's communicating to us, have my heart, then you'll be happy with what I give. Then you'll be satisfied. You'll be satisfied when you have my heart. Why? Because it's my heart. <laughs> then no matter what you have, what you're blessed with, you'll be happy. When you have my heart, you'll be happy with what I give. Jonah is not that way, right? He's just not that way. He is exceedingly, to use the term in the, in the book, he's exceedingly successful. And he was angry in the same sentence. The guy just was a part of one of the biggest revivals that's ever been, right? And he's exceedingly angry. Why? Because God didn't squash him dead like he hoped. That's proof that Jonah doesn't have the heart of God. Now, before we get ready to throw stones at Jonah, have you ever argued with God and, and when you really back up, you realize you were just being like a little kid and you were wrong? Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to argue with God. Oh, no, no, no. There's plenty of instances in Scripture where people have wrestled with God, argued with God. But he encourages us to engage with him, but not to wring your fist and say, scoot over, God. You're in my chair. Get out. That's what Jonah is doing. He's angry that God didn't do what Jonah wanted. Jonah says, okay, kill him. And it's so wrong. So he's arguing with God. He's acting like a five-year-old who's pitching a fit. He's pitching it. Okay. Moms, you probably will understand this better than dads just because it happens more often. I don't know why. Maybe it's because moms do the shopping more and guys are busy doing manly, you know, fixing cars and digging things and getting sweaty at home things. But moms, you may understand this a little more. Guys, you probably will get it, but more. All right. For when you're in a stressful situation in the grocery store, and that five-year-old, or more than one five-year-old, if you're like our family, decides it's time to have a stinking full-on five-alarm meltdown right there in the store. I'm talking, flipping out on the ground, snot bubbles going, screaming, everyone's looking at you and wondering, what are you going to do? You ever been there? I can tell you this. We have been there, but it was very short-lived. But I can tell you, I understand it. You guys, anybody been there? That's Jonah right now. That's Jonah right now. Jonah is acting like a petulant, spoiled, snotty little brat who's arguing with dad about why he can't get what he wants and do you see what God's doing he's being so kind he's being so kind think about it for a sec how many times did we see the word appointed in in the last chapter God appointed a plant God appointed a worm. 
God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he was faint. Why did God appoint those things? Was he just like poking the bear? I'm just poking the bear. I'm so, so, (laughs) I'm going to get this Jonah. I'm going to make him submit, but I'm going to do it in a nasty, wasty way. I don't think so. I think what we're seeing here is mercy. I think we're seeing kindness and mercy. I think we're seeing God reason with Jonah, even though Jonah really deserves to get his butt spanked. Jonah deserves a butt whooping, but God is trying to reason with Jonah Everything from the fish to all of this stuff that happened before and the fear and the storm and and then they repent and he's having a fit and and he appointed a plant and then he appointed a worm and then he appointed a scorching heat. God is being overly merciful to this guy who really deserves to get spanked. It's an act of mercy. Jonah's heart is what needs to be corrected. Do, do you think that God do you think that God was being patient with Jonah? Because I do. I think he was being overly patient with Jonah. And I'm saying if there was a mirror here, I'd be like looking at me. Because yeah, I've been on the receiving end of God's mercy when I did not deserve it. You guys hearing what I'm saying? How many of you have been on the receiving end of God's mercy when we flat out were having a fit and really deserve to get a spanking? I think you know what I mean. I think we all know what I mean. God asks Jonah, do you do well to be angry? God is reasoning with him. The plant, the worm, the wind, these are all acts of mercy. Here's a question for you guys. Have you ever been pushed by God where in the moment you just feel like, are you picking on me? Uh, Why? Oh, of course now. Now it's got to be that the tire goes flat on the car. Or, of course, we run out of money and we've overdrafted the account. Or, of course, the blah, blah, blah. Or, of course, this happens. Or, of course, my sister-in-law has to call. Or my dad is now involved in this, and I I can't handle it. And you blame God. How many have been there? And you're arguing with God, like Jonah. Now, let's go back and remember something. Jonah was exceedingly successful, but... He was unhappy. Why was he unhappy, guys? This is where you type in. Why was he unhappy? Because he did not have the heart of God. He he didn't have the heart of God. We are always going to wrestle with the stuff of life. We're always going to feel like we're being pushed and prodded and it'll it'll feel negative unless we have the heart of god then if you have the heart of god then you can see past the temporary to what he's creating you to be let me tell you what here's something Let me ask you something. Have you ever been to a beautiful orchard? I'm talking like nice orchard. Big fruit. I don't care. Your Pick your favorite fruit. Have you ever been to a really nice orchard? Tre- trees just looking good. Great. Everything's cleaned up, lined up straight. How many of you guys have ever been there? Anybody? This is a real question because I think it's going to make a really good illustration. Nice orchard. Okay. 
Peaches, apples, grapes near here, says Jen. Okay. Well, I, I got to tell you, ladies and gents, if trees, if those orchard, those fruit trees, if they could scream in pain, we would never prune them. They would never get to where it is that they would look the best that they can be. They would never put out the fruit that they were designed to put out. They would never become the most amazing thing that they could possibly be if we refused to trim away the stuff that shouldn't be there to make it more fruitful, to make it healthy, to make it what it was designed to do. Yeah, I'm talking about us. You get it. You get it. Because the truth is, if we refuse to see that God is actually doing acts of mercy to us, like he was with Jonah, if we won't see that he's actually doing something that's going to grow you and shape you and mold you into something even more beautiful, even more fruitful, if you won't see that, we're always going to think just it's all bad, negative, negative, negative. God's picking on me. You won't have the heart of God. You see what I'm saying, guys? Now, when we get right down to it, when we get right down to it, this whole end section here where Jonah is arguing with God and and um, Jonah goes out of the city and sits down and made a booth for himself there. I saw, by the way, earlier that Jen had put up the definition of the booth here. Um, the reason for that. Uh, I think she she did well by putting the definition up there because a lot of people don't know. It's called a sukkah. S-U-C-C-A, I believe it's spelled. It's uh, it's for, it's for, uh, it's re- referenced in Sukkot, the Jewish celebration, which is um, when the, when uh, the Israelites came out of Egypt and they traveled in the wilderness, they didn't have permanent buildings they built booths and it was a uh, or tents whatever they had but it was like a temporary shelter and that's what this is um just so that you're aware of why what do you mean a booth like was he taking taxes out there no 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 it's it's like a, you may have seen folks do it um during Sukkot they Jewish people and Torah observant folks will put up what's called a sukkah Temporary shelter. And it's to remind you, you're supposed to eat in it. It's part of the whole ceremony, part part of the celebration. You're supposed to eat in it as a reminder, a visual, very visual reminder of what God was doing for the Israelites. Okay? So that's why that's there. But I, I wanna I wanna refocus on Jonah here. The bottom line is Who's the boss in your life? (laughs) Get right to it, Brad. Here we go. Time to preach. Who's the boss in your life? Are you the boss in your life? Do you tell God what is going to be and then conform him to what you want to happen? Oh, Brad. Or... Do you allow him to mold and shape you? Do you allow him to prune you, even though it stinks sometimes, even though it hurts a little bit? Things, some things got to go, or else I can't be as fruitful as I should be, as I was created to be. Do you fight God's hand in making you more holy? Are, Are you saying to God, And now I know I'm hammering this and I'm doing it on purpose. So hang with me, folks. Are you saying to God, excuse me, you're sitting in my chair. Do you mind moving over? Because I think you're really intruding in my decision. Folks. (sighs) 
all I can say, going back, there's nothing wrong with taking your emotions to God, and there's nothing even wrong with arguing with God, but don't shake your fists at him and go, you are not the Lord of my life. What did, what did Satan do? I will be like God, right? Well, what is that? What is that? When Satan, Hasatan, the accuser, yeah, Satan, the devil. <laughs> what is that when he, in the Bible, says that I will be like God? Well, isn't that the same thing as saying, scoot over God? You're in my chair. I'll be the Lord now. Oh, man, Brad, that's ugly. Are you trying to say that that's when we say, God, I'll make these decisions. You have no right. Whew. So here's here's what I'm here's what I want to talk about here for the last few minutes. Um. We need to refocus daily, ladies and gents, to remember who's in the driver's seat. You or God. You guys remember, it was pretty popular when I was like a teenager, young teenager maybe. There was a, uh, like everybody had these bumper stickers or even like uh, license plates on their like nice conversion vans that would say like, God is my co-pilot. God is my co-pilot. And I know what they meant. They weren't meaning anything bad like, hey, I'm with God, God's with me. I get it. But if God's your co-pilot, who's piloting? Cause you stink at it. <laughs> and so do I. And I don't mean driving. I mean when we say, oh, we'll make those decisions. We'll decide excuse me, <clears throat> Jonah, will decide. If you were Jonah, you know what would have happened? All those 120,000 people would have perished in flames if it was Jonah. Why? Because he wanted to be in the driver's seat. Now, I don't know where you are today. I don't know what struggles you're having. I don't know what God is asking of you patiently like Jonah, do you do well to be upset about this? Do you do well, Moni? Do you do well, Delaney B, to do this? Do you, or should you be upset, Scott? Should you be raising this horrible heart of non-mercy, non-submission, I'll do it my way. Hey, I'm not talking just to you guys. I'm talking to me. BP Devo, Judy, Will, Jess. Do we do well to say move out of my chair, God? Oof. Now I'm I'm here to tell you guys, I make mistakes just like everybody else. But I can tell you this too. When we make those mistakes, we say, thank you, Jesus. We say, thank you, Jesus. Please forgive me. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price that I could not pay to fix this screw up. And I have screwed up. And please forgive me. Mold me and shape me, Lord. I accept your mercy. I accept your forgiveness. I, I'm so grateful that you've ransomed me because you know what? I would have been like Jonah. I would have decided my way is better. I would have said, Lord, let's do it my way. And I, I repent. I repent of that horrible, horrible, heart sick attitude. And I want you in my heart, Jesus. I want you. That, that's where we should be, ladies and gents. Oh. 
And I can tell you this, you want, here's a promise. Here's a promise. You ready for this? When we really see what's going on and submit, even when things are hard, I mean difficult, when we do that, it may not fix all of the, the intricacies of the situation. There still may be trouble in River City. There may be problems, right? But I can tell you this, when you know that you're forgiven and you know that God is with you and you know that you're in the right spot, you're going to have a whole different attitude and that leads to peace. That leads to understanding. And when you submit, that's when you can truly see the heart of God and things change and they change for the better. And you know what I'm talking about. When you've done it, how many of you guys have been there? How many of you guys have been there where you, you've realized, okay, this is bad. And you caught yourself. And instead of reacting... You got proactive and said, Father God, I need you. Peace that passes all understanding. Now, before we um, say goodbye to Jonah today, I want to remind you, who wrote this book? Please, Answer the question in the chat. Who wrote the book? <clears throat> Delaney B. Jonah. Jen. Jonah. We wouldn't really know about these screw-ups and how bad of a dude he was unless he came clean and repented and said, Here's what I did. Don't do this. We wouldn't even know about it. There's another lesson to be learned here in the book of Jonah. He's one of the greatest preachers that ever lived, right? But he's also one of the biggest screw-ups. <laughs> and the other lesson, guys, is that even with all these great successes and failures, he had a heart that was humble enough to write it all down, knowing that for all of history, he would be known as this. Why? Why? Because he wants you to know that when you submit to God, things go a lot better and don't do what I did. This is a life lesson. This is this is a beautiful illustration. So the question today as we come to a close with the book of Jonah is what what is the biggest lesson you learned? Question. You may have learned 10 things. I learned a lot in this in this study. What's the biggest thing that that jumps out at you? Think about it. Pray about it. As we go throughout our day, guys, I'm here to tell you it is not enough for us just to listen to a, a thing on YouTube and then walk on and there's no change. If there's no change, then am I just like entertainment? Because I promise you I'm not that entertaining. This is all about submitting to God and then doing something about it. Matthew chapter 28. I want you to, we're going to pray here in a second, but as I let the stream go, put your thoughts in here on the study and jump over to the, uh, to the, uh, the forum on everydayoutreach.com. Talk about it over there. Think about it. Pray about it. You know, one of the big ones for me is that God showed mercy. This is before Jesus death, burial, and resurrection. So before true, full redemption, he showed mercy to all those people. God's not just for the air quotes, 
elect. He's for everybody. The Ninevites. Yeah, they messed up later. But they did it like Israel. I mean, Israel had that cycle. God's for everybody. Now, let's pray, and then I've got some news for you. Okay? <clears throat> Father God, thank you so much for this study in Jonah. Lord, help us to uh, dwell on what you want us to think about and submit to you. Help us to get serious about it daily. Forgive us when we fail you. And Lord, please help us to be your hands and feet. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Amen. Okay. Brutus and B, right? You can get it now on Amazon. You can get it on the uh, Kindle. And you can get it from our website. And I am saying I hope you'll like it. It's it's really a lot of fun. Great for kids. Great for adults. Life lessons. Jump in there and grab it. Grab some to share because you know what? It's a great way, easy way to share. Hey, you should check out this Bible Devo. My pastor wrote this book. What do you think? So tomorrow, we're going we're gonna to soldier on, and we're going to start a new book. So we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. You know your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me for you. The God of my salvation for you. I From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord Who made heaven and earth The Lord will keep you from All evil He will keep your life The sun shall not strike you by day Bye.